It's time to begin this evening. We're glad everyone is here. And if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. And please come back at any opportunity you might have. In regards to our sick, um, these are the ones I have for tonight. Sherry Coble, I remember her. She's still at home recouping from shoulder surgery. Uh, Kathy Reed, does, has, she's had cataract surgery. Is that what it is? She, one, she's had one cataract surgery, and then she's also has COVID now. So remember her uh, in your prayer as well. LaRonda Hunt, uh, we announced she was taken to the hospital Sunday. She is home. I continue to remember her. Galen Riley, uh, he has, uh, he's been taken back to the Calvert City Convalescence. And he is on hospice. So remember that family in your prayer. Also, Chris Rundin will be having outpatient surgery tomorrow on his elbow. Neath the faircloth, anybody heard from her? Is she doing? She's doing a little bit better. Continue to remember her as well. Gerald Rainey has um, some treatments uh, that are, uh, he's going through his treatments and uh, uh, we need to continue to remember him in our prayers as well. Those are all the sick that I have. Is there anyone else that needs to be made mention of? If not, then we'll have a prayer and then we'll get into our lesson. Heavenly Father, we come before you again thanking you for this day and the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We're thankful for this time we have to assemble together uh, to study your word. We pray that you will, uh, that we'll be able to learn tonight from the things that Jason has prepared as he speaks to us. And we pray that you'll um, continue to bless Jason in the work that he does, not only here, but through the Christian Courier and other avenues. We pray that you'll continue to bless him and his family. We're so thankful for this congregation here and the members. We pray for those who are sick, <clears throat> those who are recovering from surgery and various illnesses. We pray that you will be with them, be with the doctors that are taking care of them, that they may regain their health if it be your will. We're most thankful for Christ and the sacrifice he made and the hope that we have through him. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. I'm happy to be with you and glad to see you here on this Wednesday evening. And we will continue this reflection on great people, uh, the Old Testament, by thinking about some matters from 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles relative to Hezekiah. So our faithful and dedicated crew upstairs is diligently working through some technical issues, but we'll press forward and uh, do the best we can as they sort that out. You might be able to remember back to a transition period in your life when you were striving for that independence as a, a young person, making that transition from the latter stages of childhood into adulthood. And um, you might have had some tension with your folks. I don't, I don't know. It can, be a, it can be a challenging period of time. Now, I never went through anything like that myself because, you see, I was the youngest of three, and my mom and dad worked out all the kinks by the time they got to me. Yeah, yeah, you, right, oh, oh, gets away with everything, but, uh, you know, it's a challenging time, it's a challenging time for young adults, it's a challenging time for parents, and even in the best of scenarios, we all grow up 
and develop a sense of moral feeling and obligation and do what's wrong. Even in the best of environments. Well, what's it like for those who grow up in a very difficult home? Maybe a home where God is not honored and revered in any way. Where wickedness is encouraged. If young adults struggle who are brought up in the best of environments, how challenging it must be for those who are not. But yet there are many, many people who have overcome very difficult circumstances. And even though there was no encouragement in their youth to pursue God or spiritual objectives, yet they make personal choices and strive for a better life. Hezekiah is that young man. His father, King Ahaz, was a wicked, wicked man. And it's remarkable that not only he turned out okay, talking about Hezekiah, he turned out okay, he ends up being one of the greatest kings in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah. He ends up being everything that his father was not. And that must have been not an easy transition for him. Because when he comes to the throne, he begins one of the most thorough cleanup operations as he sought to undo everything his father had done. And so just from the standpoint of thinking about what this young man's life must have been like, we can't but admire what he chose to be and what he became. You see this verse on the chart here, 2 Kings 18 and verse 5. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. And that's why in a short list of great people in the Old Testament, Hezekiah has to be in the conversation after the Bible says something like this about him. So let's think about this remarkable young man. That is, some things that happened at the very beginning of his reign and appreciate who he chose to to be in spite of the odds. Here on this chart, I just have a couple of items to orient us about a study of King Hezekiah. We read about him in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, and you see the chapters that relate to the reading. 2 Kings 18 to 20 and 2 Chronicles 29 to 32. He lived around 700 years before Jesus. And the dates you see on the chart approximate his birth and death years. And so we fix him in this period of time, 700 years before Jesus in the period of the divided kingdom, And it might be interesting to to remember that he is a contemporary with the prophets Isaiah and Micah. So this is the time of Hezekiah. What do we read about him? What do we know about him? When you think about the fact that he was 25 years old when he came to the throne and he reigned 29 years. Out of 29 years, there's very little information. And that's not unlike the other chapters assigned to various kings. The Bible is not designed to tell us everything that ever happened in human history. It's not designed to tell us everything that ever happened in 
Israelite history. But we have these few chapters that tell us about key events. And so they must be very important about God's redemptive plan or about redemptive history. And certainly they can be helpful to us. Again, we think about what this young man must have went through. We think about the choice he made to break with his father's ways and be a different king, a different person. And we think about in light of the fact of everything he never saw growing up. Never saw his dad observing the Passover. Never saw his dad praying to the Lord and humbling his heart. No, he saw the idols. He saw the festivals associated with idolatry. He saw him reject Isaiah's counsel. He, he saw many things, but it didn't have anything to do with fidelity to the Lord. So here he is, and we have few, few events about his 29-year reign. They are these, you can see on the chart. As with all the kings, we have some vital statistics and family information. We have how old he was, how long he reigned, who his mother was, and what kind of person he was. You remember this kind of refrain over and over again? He did that which was right, or he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. There's this moral characterization of all of these kings. Well, of Hezekiah, we learn he was 25, reigned 29 years, his mother was Abijah, and he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And this interesting detail is added according to to his father David. So there's that comparison. But here are the details about his reign and his life that are the few details related in the scriptures. His reforms. And then his illness. He was about 36 years old and God said, you're going to die. And he pled with the Lord and the Lord healed him and gave him 15 more years. And so he likely lived to be about 54. One of his mistakes, he wasn't a perfect man in spite of all the accolades Scripture assigns to him, but one of his major mistakes is among the few things recorded about his life and his reign. And then the major crisis that he experienced as king takes up quite a bit of the space assigned to covering his reign and life. Now with a couple of these I've put some scriptures and I just want to, to make an observation with you for a minute. Look at the line about his reforms. 2 Kings 18, 4-6 discusses his reforms. Look how much material in 2 Chronicles is assigned to that same topic. So 2 Chronicles 29 to 31 is going to give us much more detail than just the three verses in 2 Kings. Now let's go down to major crisis. There's one chapter in 2 Chronicles assigned to this crisis. But nearly all of the material in 2 Kings relates to this same incident. And so these two things are really what take up the most space in the scriptures regarding his life and reign. Tonight we're going to concentrate on his reforms. And then... Next Wednesday night, we're going to talk about this major crisis. And there are a lot of details and a lot of helpful, I think, lessons to be learned from this great man who rose to such a wonderful position of influence and godliness, not because he had help, not because he had a good start, but because he chose to be a righteous man. Now I'm going to relate in terms of this topic of his reforms to 2 Chronicles. Again, that covers much more in detail 
the reforms of Hezekiah. So if you see these three points on the chart, just think chapter 29, chapter 30, and chapter 31. Chapter 29 of 2 Chronicles discusses temple worship. And then the Passover observance is what is discussed in 2 Chronicles 30. And then in chapter 31, we have a discussion of what I call planning for success or looking to the future. But all under the general topic of reforms. So let's survey the material for just a minute. And then we're going to talk about some lessons or some observations about this man's character as to why he was so successful in his reforms. If you want to open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 29, we'll hit some high points along the way and just survey the content, get our minds around what happened, what was going on with all these reforms, and why they are helpful to us today. So in chapter 29, as you see on the chart, the first thing about his reforms has to do with temple worship. If you're with me in 2 Chronicles 29, look at verse 3. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Now, what do we learn here about his first action as king? What did he do? This verse, I'm sorry. Yeah, he did. That's right. And we remember that what is said here is going to be the exact opposite of what his father was doing. At the end of chapter 28, you read how Ahaz died and his son reigned in his place. You read in verse 1, he was 25 years old. So he has seen what is going on in his country, led by his father, and this time element is so powerful. In the first year of the first month, as soon as he got opportunity, this is the first thing that he did. Opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Now, that means his father had closed the doors. That means he had closed down the temple, not just closed the doors. You know, keep the flies out, close the doors. That, that, it's closing down. And so Hezekiah said, we're going to open up the temple. And we might appreciate a reminder about the fact that the temple... While it is the focus a lot of times of different celebrations or annual pilgrimages, the temple was a place where there was daily worship. So people that live far away, they wouldn't be involved in that, and they would make those yearly treks to Jerusalem to be involved in those annual festivals. But there was still daily prayers and incense and sacrifices and so forth, and this is even reflected way down in New Testament times. You remember in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, and they met the paralyzed man who was laid daily at the gate called Beautiful. So it was frequented daily. It is a place where there was daily worship. But it was shut down. So that's what he did first, is he opened the doors of the temple. But it wasn't simply unlocking the temple, just open the doors. It was clearly in a state of disrepair. And so it had been closed for such a time that it was 
filthy, it was dirty, things were missing, and so he began a project of getting the temple refurbished and prepared for worship. So focus your minds on that objective. He is going to restore temple worship. Not just clean it up. It's not a museum. It's not just there as a monument. It's going to be functional daily for people's worship. So that's his objective that he starts at the very beginning, to reopen the temple. We read in verse 4, he brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out this filth from the holy place. We read on here, and he gives them a motivational speech. He gives them, here are the reasons why we need to do this. Here is what we need to be thinking about. Here are the good things that could happen if we follow the Lord. And so he really energizes them clearly. And what the text bears out is they got to work, and it took them about 16 days just to clean the temple. And it talks about them hauling out and throwing into the valley east of the temple, into the valley Kidron, throwing, whether it was idols or various utensils used in idol worship or just cleaning the place out. Maybe somebody had left a couch in there. Who knows what had gone on? As at times, the temple had become just a place where people stored junk or people began to take up residence. And so we see these things in various times, and this was one of those dark hours. And so it was cleaned up over a period of 16 days. The text then relates how the process developed you have to clean the temple itself, and then the priests and the Levites have to be clean. Well, what does that mean? Not that they had, you know, been so dirty and filthy and sweaty, you know, all that work for 16 days, then they need to clean up. No, there was a ceremonial aspect that if you're going to function as a priest or a Levite in the service of God, you have to consecrate yourself. And there was a process by which a priest and a Levite for their various roles could be cleansed. And this didn't have anything to do with physical dirt. But they physically had to clean the temple. They had to spiritually become consecrated. They then had to dedicate or rededicate The altars and so forth, by going through sacrifices, they had to get all of this up and running before temple worship could even be restored. So that was the process, and that's what chapter 9 is all about. All of the steps that had to be taken just to get to the point where they could reinstitute proper worship. It was a process. Now let's talk about chapter 30 for just a second. Passover observance. In chapter 30, verse 1, Hezekiah sent letters to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. And Those are the names of tribes standing for, at this point, the northern kingdom of Israel. Here's the interesting thing time-wise. If we fix, we can do this with pretty good accuracy. If we fix the beginning of Hezekiah's reign around 715 B.C., the northern kingdom has been destroyed already. The northern kingdom was destroyed in 721 B.C. 
And many people were deported, or rather they were captive and taken away into other countries. So there are still people living up there. It's not completely uninhabited. There were people left behind. And to these Israelites remaining after their country was just absolutely decimated by the Assyrians. Their capital city destroyed, their king killed, their citizens taken into captivity. Yet there's still some people that live in those territories. So Hezekiah sent letters to to all of these various areas, come and observe the Passover. And he makes a very passionate appeal. And there's preserved here the encouragement that he gave to people. And it might have been easy for him to say, hey, they got what was coming to them. They had all those wicked kings and they went into idolatry and they never turned back. And they got what was coming to them. Isaiah talked all about that. He said this was the rod of God's anger against the kingdom in the north. Well, he made a passionate appeal to people to turn back to the Lord. And... We'll just read one verse in this section. Look at verse 9. I'm in chapter 30, verse 9, and this is his appeal to all of these people. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you will return to him. And that reflects something about Hezekiah and his belief in the ancient promises of God. Even going back to the time of Solomon and Solomon's appeal to God that if people will turn to you, will you heal them? Bring them from afar, restore them to their land. And this is a little insight that when he makes this appeal, he believes in God and God will act and God will be merciful and God will move in this world. It says something about Hezekiah's spirituality. He really believed the promises of God. And he he encourages people to fulfill their obligation and then be blessed by God's mercy. So that's what this chapter is about. It's about this plan to observe the Passover. This happens very quickly at the beginning of his reign and because they're not able to get everything in place, the Passover is moved from its customary date from the first month and the 14th day to the second month and the 14th day just as a matter of they're trying to get everything together and be able to observe the Passover. There was a great outpouring of support for the observance of the Passover. So there's kind of some momentum now, even we would call spiritual momentum. As first the the Levites and the priests get on board and then the citizens of Jerusalem, and now people from afar. And you can see this reform in the worship of God and in spiritual thinking taking place. So there's a process involved in this Passover celebration. They have bumps in the road. They can't do it in the right time. They don't have the people in place to be able to fulfill all of the sacrifices. Levites step in and assist the priests with the killing of various sacrifices. So there, there's some bumps in the road. And then there are people who, who come from afar and they are ready to eat the Passover and participate. But they haven't gone through the ritual cleansing that normally attached to this. And God pre- and I'm sorry, Hezekiah prays to God. Can we go ahead and and have the Passover, even though some of these cleansing rituals haven't been fulfilled? 
And God gives him permission to do that. And they're able to then institute a Passover feast. Normally after the Passover there was a period of seven days called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And things went so well and people were so encouraged by this event that they ended up staying on for another seven days. And so it was a real sincere restoration of one of the most important celebrations in Israel's life. The Passover, the Lamb, the very moment God saved them out of bondage, provided a substitute to save their sons, their firstborn. And that moment was supposed to be remembered every year by the killing and the eating of the Passover lamb and the associated feast to follow. I'll just read this verse in chapter 30 if you want to take a look at it with me. 2 Chronicles 30 verse 26, So there was great joy in Jerusalem for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. That's like 250 years. What does that say about Hezekiah and what he was able to accomplish? And again, we go back to this very practical observation. This is not how he was raised. This is not what he saw. But he said, I'm going to do what's right. And we need to observe the Passover. We need to be thankful for God and His protection, His guidance in our history and in our lives. And so it was such a success. There hadn't been anything like it for 20, 250 years, the Bible says. Now, what is chapter 31 about? Chapter 31 is about planning for the future. And particularly, spiritual success. And I'll just summarize it by saying, chapter 31, verse 2, Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and Levites. He organized for future worship. And so there needs to be a recognition of these ancient divisions. We need to create a role. There are Levites maybe scattered throughout the land. They've been out of work or disinterested for a very long time. They begin to recruit, consecrate, enroll, and organize for the future. So then verse 3 says, the king contributed. We're going to have to support the worship of the Lord and those who lead us in that worship. And he commanded the people, verse 4, to give. And what we read here is that over a course of a number of months, they enjoyed a surplus of resources in the temple. And this then led Hezekiah, verse 11, to prepare chambers in the house of the Lord. They prepared then ways to collect and save and then distribute all of the resources necessary for all these sacrifices, all these worship times daily that would be going on and the festivals that would come down the road. So there's a list of, of the leaders involved here. And the plan, you can see verse 17, the enrollment of the priests, verse 18, they were enrolled with their little children. They're organizing and planning for the future success of worship and of dedication to God. And so here's the summary at the very end of the chapter. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord God, before the Lord his God. And every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God and in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. What a wonderful summary statement 
of his dedication to do what's good, to do what's right, to be faithful. And he did it with all his heart, and he was successful. So that summarizes then his reforms. Now, just briefly looking at these three chapters, we see first he instituted temple worship. Then he restored the Passover. And then he looked forward to providing for the future. This summarizes his spiritual leadership in these reforms. Now here's where we want to just kind of look at what happened and draw some very helpful lessons. For the church, for families, in our Christian life, here are many important, valuable things that Hezekiah did that can be redeployed in our lives today. Let's just step back and think about how this man was a great spiritual, successful, influential person to do one of the most remarkable turnarounds in the history of Israel. First of all, let's talk about accountability. What we mean by accountability is that Hezekiah understood, okay, even though he's king, he's in charge, he is at the top, yet yeah, wait a minute, there's somebody above him, who would that be? God. He is accountable to God. And he recognized that many of the problems that had plagued their nation were a direct result of failing to do what's right. And God had held them responsible. Back in chapter 28, we can read about under the leadership of his father how the Syrians came down and oppressed them, attacked them, killed people, took captives, they were afflicted by their neighbors to the north. We can read about how the Assyrians came against the northern kingdom and how this was no picnic for the southern kingdom either with this vicious army on their doorstep. Hezekiah was astute enough to know how is it that God's people could be suffering like this? We are accountable to God. And we cannot reject Him as our God and as our leader, as our creator, as ultimately our king. We can't do that with impunity. We can't expect to avoid responsibility. And when Hezekiah came to the throne, he knew the responsibility was with him to do what's right before God. He was going to be held accountable for his time in leadership. And the people would be held responsible for following or not. So this passage that I've listed on the chart regarding accountability is interesting because it's a little window into his awareness of this matter. And I'll just read it just quickly without much comment. Second Chronicles 29, verse 5. Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out this filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They have forsaken Him and turned away their faces. And then he goes on, and he, he's giving this motivational speech and saying, this is why we've been suffering. But look at verse 10. Now, it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord. The God of Israel. In order that His fierce anger may turn away from us. We're accountable. And that is an important part of 
any spiritual success, whether it's in the home or in the church or wherever it may be, to say, I have an obligation as a leader in this home or a leader in this congregation or a member in this home or a member in this church, I have an obligation to do what's right before God Almighty. I can't play fast and loose. I'm accountable to Him. And that is where real reforms begin by saying, we're responsible to God. We will be judged by Him. And that is the truth. And so Hezekiah knew that, and that formed his thinking about responsibility in the future. Let's talk about this, and this looms large in his reforms. An objective standard. What do we mean by that? Well, how do you know what's right? Chapter 29, verse 2, it says that he did what was right as opposed to what's wrong. He talked about our fathers being unfaithful. Well, what's the standard? Let me just reference a couple of things with you in this uh, section of Scripture about Hezekiah. Notice in chapter 29, verse 11. He's talking to the priests and Levites. My sons, do not be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in His presence. Now, he didn't get the the people from Judah, and he didn't gather the people from Benjamin or other tribes. Why not? When he's going to reinstitute temple worship, There's a standard. And he says here, God chose you. What's he referring back to? 700 years ago, when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, God chose you. Levites and priests from the tribe of Levi to lead the worship in the house of the Lord. And this then is just threaded throughout this section. Look at, if you will, verse 15. Chapter 29, verse 15. They gathered their brothers and consecrated them themselves and went in as the king had commanded by the word of the Lord. That is, the ultimate authority was not the king. The king was saying, we're going to do what God says. And they consecrated themselves and followed the word of the Lord. Similarly, in chapter 30, verse 12, the same expression is found. But I want to look in chapter 30 to verse 5 for just a minute. And this is talking about the Passover. And this, again, is one of the clear indications and yields a very important lesson. The Passover, this decree was sent out through all Israel from Beersheba to Dan, from the south to the north that the people should come and keep the Passover, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. The ESV says, or King James and American Standards say, as written. Now look at that. Hezekiah doesn't say, well, we're going to, we're going to start doing this Passover thing again. And, and uh, you know, anybody got any suggestions on how we might do this or when or how often? It was written. It was written. And I'll tell you one of the biggest problems in our world today and in the thinking of so many people is they don't have to go by what's written. Experience now is, is kind of the substitute for any objective authority. Well, I, I know, I, well, I, know I, was, I was saved because I had a warm feeling come over me. And I had a discussion with a fellow one time, and we went over and over the plan of salvation, and he rejected everything that the Bible was saying, but knew he was right because he had healed a man one time. His arm was injured, and he... And, So there you go. 
Jill had a similar discussion one time in a mom's group with a lady she got to know, and she tried to have a Bible study with her, and she began to tell about the miracle that she had done. And that, that just ends all conversation. Because experience now, this is what I felt, this is what I went through, and that, that just shuts down all conversation about what the Bible says. And you can go way back to Hezekiah and you can see a very important principle that is as timeless and relevant today as ever. God told us what He wanted. God told us and wrote it down. It doesn't matter how many hundreds of years have gone by. If it's written and it's what God wants, that's it. And so you see this over and over again in this section. Just in little expressions like in chapter 30, verse 8, they kept the Passover. What does that mean? There was something to keep. And we conform to it, what's written. And then you can see in chapter 30, verse 16, notice this full expression. They took their custom post according to the law of Moses. Now that's where the written material is found. And so that's what we find here in the reforms of Hezekiah. A man who knew he was accountable to God and he knew where the information was that gave him guidance. What was written was fixed. And to do what's right, we do what's written. Well, I'll mention these without making comment as we're at the end of our time. But one lesson to be learned is the teamwork that's involved. Hezekiah didn't do all this. Hezekiah didn't implement all these. He didn't offer all the sacrifices. He built a great team. We see that it involves systematic progress. That they didn't start with the Passover. Say, let's get everybody excited and just talk about the Passover. That that would come later. They had to do things in a sequence of events to achieve good results. So this was not haphazard. This was a plan that he created. You see, this man was an optimist. He sent out letters into the northern kingdom of Israel to all of these people who have been for so long in idolatry. And the Bible says that many of them mocked him. He probably expected that. But maybe he thought, maybe there's one person up there, one person that we can reach and turn to the Lord. There's something infectious about Hezekiah's optimism. And we can't leave off just his general spirituality, his genuineness, authentic desire to do what's right. And I'll leave you with this scene. When they reinstitute temple worship and they've gone through this 16 day cleansing process and then the priests and Levites are consecrated and then they finally have the initial worship to dedicate the temple and to do those sacrifices and spread the blood on the altar the Bible says that Hezekiah the king in front of all those people bowed down and worshipped He was not above the Lord. He was a real spiritual person for whom spiritual realities were the most important. He did what was good, what was right, and what was faithful with all of his heart, and he prospered. There's a lot to be learned from this great great man in Old Testament history. Thank you. You've been kind tonight as we've reviewed these ancient details and I hope that there's something helpful to you that will encourage you maybe to go back and read these chapters and be blessed by them.
Our first song this afternoon afternoon will be number 502. Number 502. Our invitation song will be number 67, number 67. Our scripture tonight comes from Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was the keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? I can, I can tell you as father of two little girls, um, there is... Nothing more exciting to me than having a long day of work and coming home sometimes. And not every time when I get home, but, but especially when the weather's nice, coming home and getting out of that car and 
here's two little pairs of bare feet running out the door to greet me in the driveway and climb in the car with me. And sometimes we have to sit and maybe even put it in drive up and down the driveway a few times and all. But our lesson tonight is, uh, is called Parents in Pain. And as we read in the scripture there just a few moments ago, um, we all know the story of, of Cain and Abel. And as the, the overwhelming joy that comes from, from Adam and Eve of, of having two sons and, and being his parents, we, we can't imagine the, the pain that was probably felt by them as well. And, and as we read on, as we read there, um, you know, as, as was read uh, there in, in verse, verse 8, um, it says, as Cain, talked with his, as Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, and Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. I can't imagine what that would be like for, for Adam and Eve, his parents, to wonder, you know, where, where did we go wrong? Why, why, do they, why are they against each other? You know, why do they not love each other? And that has to to pain on them as adults, you know, as, as parents. And so each boy, as we know, you know, they wanted to relate to God with their sacrifices there in the, the earlier verses, in, in verses 4 and 5. Um, but ultimately, God accepted one and, and rejected the other. And so as we know the story of, of Cain, he let his anger and his frustration, and that led ultimately to his spilling over his hands to, to murder his brother Abel. And so if we can envision, you know, the parents weeping and wonder what that's, wonder what that's like, um, I, I don't want to wonder what that's like. But ultimately, we're all children of God. And we have to wonder sometimes, you know, are we putting God in pain? Um, perhaps to not that extreme of a circumstance, but what are we doing to seek God and, and seek his approval? Um, because ultimately that's what, what we're here on this earth to try to do. In spite of the, the joy that I find with, you know, having my, my kids run out to the car, I know that, that being a parent is not easy. And so where do we, where do we find hope in that is, is the hope is in God. Um, all of us as his children, we find the hope that's, that's in God um, as the one who gave the life to our children, to us as his children. We have to seek out and, and hope for our children that the reconciliation and forgiveness that's offered from God will, will be good news to, to children and that they would seek him out um, and be the good news to them as it is to us as parents and ultimately we want to seek that news as well as children of God. Because we know that God loves children and, and adults fully. And so we seek to have that, that special relationship. Seek that special relationship with God and with one another. And so the question tonight is, do we love God with all of our heart? There's a, a classic country song that I'll, I'll reference here. Um, Starts out as we share the same last name, same color eyes. We fought like tigers over one old red bike. I'm batting first, and you can't use my glove, but didn't take long to push come to shove. But we've got something special. It's brotherly love. Do we share that love with each other? Are we uplifting each other and seeking that love amongst each other as, as siblings in Christ? and seeking that towards our Father and God. And so the invitation is open tonight to, if you need that brotherly love, to seek that out. We can pray with you and pray for you together as we stand and sing.
Once again, we want to thank everybody for being here th this evening. We're glad to see each one of you, and <clears throat> if you're visiting with us, please come back at any opportunity you might have. In way of announcements, um, we'll, uh, regarding our sick, um, continue to remember Sherry Coble. Uh, she's still at home recouping from her soldier, shoulder surgery. Kathy Reed had cataract surgery in one eye, but she does have COVID, and so we need to remember her. LaRonda Hunt, um, we announced Sunday had been taken to the hospital, but she is now home. Uh, but continue to remember her. Also continue to remember Neath the Faircloth. Uh, Gerald Rainey, uh, as he's continuing his treatments, uh, remember him in your prayers. Also Galen Riley, um, he has been taken back to the Con Calvert City Convalescence Home, but he is on hospice. Uh, so remember that family in your prayers as well. Also, let's continue to remember uh, the Irvin family. Uh, Roger, uh, his uh, passed away. His funeral was Monday, so we need to continue to remember that family and your prayers as, as well. We do have a thank you note from them that says, thank, thank you to our Walnut Grove family for all of the food, visits, and prayers during this difficult time. Please continue to keep us in your prayers in the weeks and months to come as we learn to navigate without Roger. We love you all, the Irvin family. Uh, in way of other announcements, um, if you want to continue teaching or if you want to start teaching uh, this upcoming quarter, I, guess it, I believe it starts in April, uh, you need to see CORE. So if you want to continue teaching, or want to start teaching next quarter, uh, you need to see Cor Corey. Um, the annual egg hunt will be Saturday, March the 16th at 3 o'clock uh, here at the building. Uh, anyone who is willing, please donate candy and bring it uh, Sunday. And the kids need to bring six hard-boiled eggs to be colored uh, on that day of the egg hunt. If you have questions about any of that, see Michelle York. Don't forget our upcoming evidences seminar on March 22nd through 24th. Uh, please be working uh, to invite people to attend. And I think this could particularly be beneficial to youth, um, but it will be beneficial to all uh, from the topics that are being discussed. There will be a elders deacons meeting Sunday following the uh, afternoon services. If you are a elder or deacon, uh, we encourage you to attend. Uh, the ramp team built a ramp today um, uh, in lieu of building one Friday because of the weather. So, uh, But they did receive a donation today from Barbara Burkeen and Murray. So continue to remember the work uh, that the ramp team does uh, in our area. Are there any other announcements we need to make before we dismiss? Oh yeah, Sunday is uh, time change. So spring forward on all of that. Okay, remember Kenton Smith. He's been in the hospital for the past month and is taking chemo treatments. Okay, Jill's mother is scheduled for Thursday, uh, Tuesday, uh, surgery on Tuesday. And remember her in your prayers as well as Jill's father uh, who was having health issues as well. Anyone else? If not, then we'll be dismissed in closing prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for this beautiful day that has blessed us with. And we thank Thee, Father, for Thy Son and the price He paid because of our sins. And we thank Thee, Father, for Thy written words that's been left behind and for us to read, to understand that in everything we do, we should 
investigate thy word to make sure that we are doing it according to thy will. We pray, Father, for all the sick that was mentioned. Pray that I will continue to be with them and bless them and comfort them as only thy can. And we pray, Father, that each member here will do their best to be a better Christian tomorrow than what we were today. Pray thou will encourage us through thy word and give us the strength and the hope that we need. This is our prayer in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.